Yes, it's quite a long video, but these things don't come around very often. Uh, as paraglider pilots, we rely on the design and deployment of our reserve parachutes to save our lives in a really difficult situation. And my friend, Dr. Matt Wilkes, has performed some pioneering research onto this very topic. Now, the conclusions are very interesting, and because the video is quite long, I've included some timestamps to the main areas that are covered in the video, so you can skip forward and backwards if you so wish. But I would really recommend watching it if you're a pilot for your own safety. Share it with your friends so we can get the word spread. And more importantly, share it with equipment manufacturers so that in the future we can all have better, safer equipment for an emergency. So grab a drink and let's learn about the latest research in parachute design and deployment. Hi everyone, hope you're well. Reserve parachutes are a really important piece of equipment that will keep you safe when uh, in a really difficult situation when your wing has gone haywire. But uh, even though they work very well, the decision to throw and how you throw them can be the difference between life and death. And looking at this specific issue uh, is a friend of mine, Dr. Matt Wilkes, that has conducted a really interesting scientific study. So I thought would have Matt to tell us about it. Hi, Andre. Thank you so much for having me on the videos. Uh, I'm really excited to talk about the work that we've been doing. As you rightly say, reserve parachutes can be the difference between life and death. And I think more importantly, reserve parachutes are the end point of a chain of survival, of which the most important step is that you actually make the decision to throw your reserve. But accident investigations have shown that we don't do that, or we don't do that in time. In other words, when we come to throwing our reserve, we might be very low, very stressed, and in serious danger. And that means that the reserve parachute has to work. So when we decide to throw it, we have to be able to get it out quickly and easily. Not only that, but we have to be able to do it under conditions of severe stress. So it's been shown in helicopter underwater escape training, which is where you get people, you put them in a helicopter, fuselage, you dunk them in a pool at night, upside down, super stressed, that actually, when we're really scared, when, we're getting, when we've got loads of adrenaline flowing around our system, we tend to forget everything that we've been told and we tend to behave in a number of very basic, very instinctive ways. And what they discovered with the helicopter work is that if we can design our equipment around the way we behave under stress, then we're gonna have much more success. So what I wanted to do with the study was I wanted to look at how people behave when they try and deploy their reserve and see if we could make our equipment any better. I really wanted to work out if there was a way we could design the reserve parachute system so not only it comes out more reliably, but it works in harmony with our natural responses. But aren't reserves and deployment mechanisms already tested by manufacturers? So yes, you're right, the equipment is tested by manufacturers, but actually a whole reserve system may be made up of equipment made by a number of different people. So you might have the reserve parachute made by one manufacturer, the bag made by another, the handle made by another, the harness made by another, in theory. So I thought rather than looking at test pilots with standard gear under standard conditions, let's look at ordinary pilots with their own mismatch of gear and see what they actually do. And in that way, hopefully we can work out what works and how we can design things that work in harmony with us for normal pilots. If you look at all safety equipment, it always evolves towards standardization and simplification and the aim of my study was to work out how we could do that in paragliding. Okay so you have a pretty good idea of what you want to look out for and what you want to test. Uh, how, how did you go about it? I was really lucky to find an event run by the Thames Valley Hang Gliding and Paragliding Club called the Big Fat Repack. Every year they get their club members together and they set up a zip line and they send the paraglider pilots down the zip line and they get to throw their reserve parachute and then it gets repacked. So I used that as the basis for the tests, but I wanted to make it a little bit more scientific and a little bit more realistic and challenging for the pilots. So who was the typical pilot that took part in this study? So we had 55 fantastic volunteers. Um, average age was 49, 
Um, the important bit for me was half of the pilots there had been flying for three years or less and about half flew 25 hours a year or less. So these are pilots who are the kind we might have in the UK who will go out and go flying on a weekend and when they go flying they will not necessarily be expecting to throw their reserve. So this is, this is the kind of baseline that the kit has to work for. If we looked at their experience, which we went into in some detail, about half had some experience of reserve throw. So what we meant by that was they'd either thrown it before in an emergency, they'd thrown it before in an SIV, or they'd thrown it before in an indoor event. So about half the pilots had never thrown their reserve before. Okay, so that, that sounds pretty typical in terms of the, the target group. What about the, uh, the apparatus, if you will? Because uh, we talked about this before whilst it was going on and uh, I thought it was uh, pretty interesting the way you've uh, contrived the test. Thanks, Andre. Like we, uh, we spent quite a lot of time and had quite a lot of fun working out the best way to do it. So uh, what I'll do is actually just take you through what a typical pilot would do when they went into the study. So... The first thing was we uh, contacted them by email, we got in touch with them, we sent them questionnaires that looked at their levels of experience, looked a bit at their gear. And then when they came on the day, we asked them about how they were feeling. Were they feeling anxious about the event? Were they feeling cool about it? Um, and then we put them in a practice station. In the practice station, they were suspended in their harness um, and we gave them the opportunity to practice the tasks they would do on the zip line and also a standard set of instructions because we wanted everyone to be operating from the same baseline. So we said to them, what we'd like you to do is when you're released from the zip line, which is gonna be a surprise, we'd like you to rapidly locate the deployment handle, extract the bag, throw the reserve hard away from the paraglider and release the deployment handle. So in essence, this is the minimum set of instructions that someone would have if they just read the manual of a typical reserve parachute, because that's pretty much what it says in all of them. We then gave them the opportunity to practice locating their reserve handle. The idea being that, again, everyone was operating from the same baseline. And also it let us measure a few things like what their shoulder angles were, how their arms were arranged and whether they could reach it with both hands. So having had their practice station, the idea being that at this point, everyone's on the level. They all went up to the zipline platform. Now, we'd taken the, a sort of standard zipline trolley, we'd put some spreader bars underneath that, and we'd suspended uh, the harnesses, we spent two hang points for the harnesses underneath the spreader bars. Around that, we'd built a frame for two GoPros, and we'd also built some tasks into the whole setup. So when a pilot came up, they would clamber over the side, and they'd be held at quite an awkward angle by a tether we'd then get them to look up at two LED lights and put their hands in some dummy brake lines. And as the LED lights flashed, they had to match the lights flashing with their brake inputs. We also then asked them to think of every word they could beginning with the letter A. And we got some pretty choice words. Um, the idea being that when they were released from the zip line, which happened 50 to 60 seconds later by surprise, that their hands would be in a typical position, their eyes would be looking upwards, their brain would be completely engaged. In other words, this is someone who is in an emergency trying to fix their wing. As soon as they felt that release, they then had to make what in cognitive psychology would be called a task switch. They had to change their whole mental track from I'm going to fix my paraglider to I'm going to throw my reserve. Because of the angle at which they were held when they were released, they kind of had a bit of yaw, a bit of pitch, um, and a bit of a drop. So there was a kind of physical sensation to accompany it all. We asked them afterwards, really we kind of wanted to know whether this worked. So we asked them afterwards whether they felt anxious, whether they felt concentrated, and over 80% of the pilots felt that they were very or completely concentrated on the task before they were released. So I think to a degree we succeeded in what we were trying to do. So with all those pilots and all that equipment, you probably ended up with a lot of video and a lot of data. So how did you process it and what results did you find? So I locked myself in a room for a couple of weeks and looked through all of the data first myself. Um, I then did some quantitative analysis. So I looked at deployment times and a little bit about uh, deployment angles. But for me, the most important part was that I then took the raw videos 
of all the participants to two expert focus groups. So in the first one, we went to Flyo in Annecy and with their instructors, Fab, Malin, Jack, we went through all the videos and we commented on them and we looked at stuff and we analyzed them and we really used the benefit of their experience to kind of mine the data as well we could. Uh, I then did the same thing with another expert group with Dave Thompson and Bill Morris, who are from the British Hang Gliding and Paragliding Association, um, with Nick Smith, who's a flight test engineer for Airbus, and with Becky Charles, who is a lecturer in human factors and ergonomics at Cranfield. So a whole bunch of experts. And I recorded our conversations and then I went on to analyse and summarise them. So the results that we got from the study are really a mix of my impressions from the video, the kind of quantitative stats we can derive from the video and the impressions of all these experts all brought together. Okay, so from from overall to then obviously more specific results, what, what did you find? What were the uh, interesting things that maybe uh, you weren't expecting? Um, I think there was so much and actually I was really delighted because it felt, it was a bit of a gamble doing this study and it actually felt like we've got a lot from it. So first of all, in general terms, reserves do work pretty well. We had 55 participants, 53 were able to pull their reserve successfully within five seconds, which I suppose is good, except that does mean that two people or 4% of people would have died. So that kind of underlined the importance of what we were doing, really. Um, if we start with the practice station, the interesting thing there was that 70% of participants could reach the reserve handle with both hands. But that meant that eight of them could only do so with difficulty and six could only reach it with one hand full stop. So when we start to think about entanglements, twists, rotational forces, all of these things, me personally, I would rather be able to reach my reserve with both hands. In terms of the amount of time it took people to throw their reserves, I looked at two different timings. Um, the first was the overall amount of time for when they were released to when they managed to let go of the deployment bag. And for that, the average time was 2.6 seconds and the range was between 1.4 and 5.1 seconds. That's pretty respectable. I then subtracted reaction time from it by looking at the amount of time purely between when people let go of their brake handles to when they threw their reserve, to when they let go of the deployment bag. In other words, they'd worked out, they know they made that task switch and they'd already started down that route to deploying their reserve. And for those guys, mean time was 1.85 seconds and the range was 0.8 to 3.7. So for me, that's useful in the sense that we can now say a benchmark for an average pilot from the point at which they commit to throwing a reserve to releasing the deployment bag should is generally speaking about two seconds under these circumstances. When I did the analysis, I broke everything down into the stages of reserve deployment. So the first thing that we looked at was when they were released from the zip line, what did their bodies do? What did their eyes do? What did their hands do? So the first thing that generally happened when they were released was they jolted themselves upwards and they braced somehow. They either braced on the brake line, so they put in a really big brake input, um, or they cross brace, they grab one of their risers, they grab the opposite riser. Um, and then having almost steadied themselves, they then made an effort to find the handle. Now, when I learned to throw a reserve, I was always told that you have to look for it first. Actually, in practice, most people don't look for it, they feel for it. So while about 80% of participants turn their head towards the reserve side, when we looked at the videos, it only seemed like a very small fraction of those were actually looking at the handle. What they really seemed to be doing was acknowledging the fact that their arm was about to move, but then they rapidly turned their head back to the direction they were going, or in essence, the direction they were falling. What they then did was reach for the handle with their hand. Now, in the case of front-mounted reserves, they all found it straightforwardly very easily. But for me, one of the most fascinating things of this study is in those with underseat reserves, so that was 47 of the 55 participants, 85% put their hand straight on their hip, right on their hip bone. Didn't matter where the handle was, that was where their hand went. Then if they didn't find it on their hip, they then tended to move their hand along their lateral thigh. So they kind of moved it forwards from hip to knee. 
so to me, this is a great finding because this to me means that actually we can just start sticking reserve handles on hips and then people are going to find it because in those who managed to touch the handle first time, which is about 30%, they saved half a second already on their deployment time. So for me, that was an interesting thing biomechanically. And you can sort of speculate as to why someone might do that. It might be because we're used to reaching for our phones or our wallets in our pockets, or simply we're just very good at knowing where our bones are in space. But if this is something that we're going to naturally do, we should design our kit around it. Once uh, they located the handle, um, participants tended to grip it properly before they threw. In other words, sometimes they'd grab the handle and they'd have their fingers under it, but actually they hung on until they'd managed to encircle the handle with their grip. Now, the implications for this for me is that if we're designing reserve handles, we need to make sure that they are kind of open enough or at an angle where they can be grabbed. Now, obviously, if you have a giant handle, that's going to mean that they're much more likely to have an accidental deployment. So there's going to be a compromise. But the handles have to be designed such that the person can easily get their grip around. And that's going to make a difference with big gloves as well. It's also going to make a difference if you have obstacles. So we noticed that sometimes participants would accidentally grab at their clothing or in one case, someone grabbed their stirrup at the same time. So I really concluded that from this, handles should be easily encircled with the grip on the hip if you're going to have a side mounted one and clear of all obstacles. Also, if people are not currently looking for them, you might want to find some way of engaging the visual system. So you might want lead lines, so arrows pointing towards where the reserve are, make the handles brightly coloured, make sure they're in clear visual space. Even if that doesn't actually help people's eyes move, it might still just serve as a reminder that the reserve handle is there. It might help them make that task switch from I need to fix my wing to I need to deploy my reserve. From what I remember from my own training, finding the handle is one thing, but actually getting the reserve out is a different story. And there's many techniques and many different uh, styles of reserve bag design. So what, what did you find on that? We found quite a lot of stuff here. We found stuff relating to pilot behavior and also towards equipment design. So if we start with the pilot behavior, once the pilot has got hold of the reserve handle, they've encircled it with their grip, as we know, different reserve systems, some want you to pull outwards, some want you to pull upwards. We found that 70% of participants' initial movement was upwards or upwards backwards. In other words, what participants like to do is they like to pull back with their shoulder, they like to curl their bicep, they like to keep their arm close to their body. What they don't like doing is laterally extracting a bag. In fact, we even noticed that some participants would even when the bag had got stuck because they pulled upwards, instead of pulling outwards, they'd actually change their grip so they could pull upwards harder. So this is clearly an overwhelming natural instinct for people, is they want to keep their hands close to their body, their arms close to their body, and they want to use the strong muscles of the arm and chest. Because if you think about a lateral pull, if you're trying to pull the bag out sideways, the point at which you're trying to apply most force is actually quite a vulnerable point in the movement arc of the shoulder. It's a less instinctive thing to do. The other thing that when uh, I was taught to throw a reserve, I got taught a bunch of different stuff. So I got taught uh, initially that you should pull the bag out and then you should bring it forwards and throw it backwards. I've had other people say, oh, you need to throw it towards your feet or the only important thing is you throw it in clear space or you need to throw it hard or you need to drop it. I think actually from this study, I've come to some fairly solid conclusions about how I would like to throw a reserve. The first is that once the bag is out, I want to throw it away in a single sweeping action. And the reason for that is that the people who tried to pull the bag out in one direction and then throw it the other, for a start, they were slower. So they were again about half a second slower. But also we saw many more complications of that. We saw more entanglement, we saw more bag strip. In one particular case, we saw a guy who, because the bag has its own inertia, it kind of dangles a little bit behind wherever your throwing hand is. The inertia of the bag meant that the bridle of the reserve bag wrapped around the guy's wrist. In other words, had that parachute then deployed, that would have ripped his arm out of his shoulder socket. 
So for me, I want to throw the reserve in a single clean backwards sweep. But if, you, if you're if trying to pull it out of the harness and throw in the same single action, is that going to make the throw less powerful? And how do you then take into account where your wing might be? Because it might be in front of you or it might be behind where you're going to throw. I think whether or not a throw needs to be powerful actually depends a lot on the situation. Because if you are in, say, a slow auto rotation and you just drop the reserve bag, the reserve bag may hang below you and the reserve may never deploy. So under those circumstances, you definitely want to throw powerfully. However, if you are in a spiral or some with very strong rotational forces, all you need to do is drop the bag into the airflow and the reserve will deploy very rapidly. So again, that's circumstantial. In terms of throwing it in a particular direction, to be honest, having seen 55 pilots like me go down a zip line and just try and get their reserve out, I think it's unrealistic to ask someone to be situationally aware enough to throw their reserve in a particular direction. For me, I think a much simpler message of just get it out in a single sweep is likely to be more helpful. So that's for under seat mounted reserves. Does that make the situation any better if they're front mounted? So I was, as any human would, would be a little bit biased going to study. I thought front mounted were going to perform really well. Um, we had eight pilots with front mounted reserves and 47 with under seat reserves. So that kind of reflects the general population. The front mounted ones, pilots certainly found them very easily and very quickly. Um, they were a bit more forgiving in terms of the single or the double movement. But what was interesting is that they weren't actually quicker. The other thing that is really important with front mounted reserve parachutes is that they have to be secured at the base. Because if they're not secured at the base, then the whole container can lift up when the pilot starts to throw and that massively reduces your mechanical advantage. One of the designs I actually quite liked was a compromise. And in this one, the reserve is front mounted, but the handle is on the side of the front mount. So you get the advantage of having that visual cue of a handle in your field of view, but you get to use the whole power of your arm, chest and back to throw it. So that might be a good compromise. Obviously though, extraction is just one part of a system and front mounted reserves have a whole host of disadvantages that we're aware of. You know, they're hard to work with reversible harnesses. You often have to connect them and disconnect them every time. They're vulnerable to jostling. They can Im impede your field of view. So I'm not saying that they're the perfect solution. And I was surprised to find that they weren't quicker, but people were certainly much better at locating them. But what about the de deployment bag itself? You know, because you can mix and match different bags in different harnesses. Is it better if the one manufacturer designed both the 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 harness and the bag deployment bag that goes with it and, and for that matter as well how big or small the reserve is because it has to fit in a certain physical amount of space one of the things when you look at safety equipment design in general is that there's always a move towards standardization the harnesses that seemed to perform better were those that had an integrated deployment bag in other words the deployment bag was made by the harness manufacturer and not the reserve manufacturer and that to me makes intuitive sense actually because the important thing is that reserve, the reserve comes out of the harness. Generally speaking, it's going to come out of the bag. There are a couple of reasons why these were better. The first is that they seem to convert the natural upward movement of the pilot's hand into lateral movement more easily. In other words, when the pilot instinctively pulled upwards, the deployment bag still came out a bit more easily sideways. But the key factor in this actually appears to be the strop. So the strop is the bit that connects the reserve handle to the deployment bag. We found a number of cases where the strop length was far too long for the size of the pilot. So particularly for smaller pilots, it meant that when they tried to pull their reserve, the bag was still in the container, even though their arms were fully stretched, which meant that if the bag did come out, they had almost no mechanical advantage. The other thing is that if the strops are really long, the bag essentially is on a longer lever. So when you try and throw it or try and manipulate it, the bag lags further behind the hand and increases the risk of entanglement. So I think that both with standardization in mind and with things like 
appropriate strap length, trying to get the bag out of the harness easily, that having an integrated deployment bag made by the same manufacturer as the harness is the way forward. So based on the methodology that you used on this, what do you think are the strengths and weaknesses of, of doing it this way? So like any scientific study, I think we have to be really critical of our work. We need to look at what our strengths and weaknesses are. Our study definitely had some strengths. I think that we managed to engage people's brains, hands and eyes in a way that it was at least closer to a real emergency than just going down a zip line or just practicing in the comfort of your own home. Um, I also think that our analysis was rigorous, scientific and involved all the right people. Being naturally self-critical, I tend to focus on all the weaknesses. So for me, the biggest weakness really was that the pilots weren't in danger. They knew that if they failed to deploy their reserve, even however anxious we made them, deep down, if they failed to deploy their reserve, they were going to be fine. So that meant that there was no requirement for altitude awareness. And perhaps more subtly, it meant that there wasn't either an inhibition to throwing either. So you can imagine if you're actually in an emergency above the ground, some part of you is going to desperately want to fix the wing and not throw the reserve parachute because a reserve descent can be quite scary. Whereas here, there was no reason that they shouldn't throw. They knew they were all there to throw their reserve parachute. So that was a weakness. Equally, there were no rotational forces. So there were G-forces. They were heading down a zip line in one direction, but they weren't getting flung around in an auto-rotation or a locked-in spiral. It was a self-selected sample. So the pilots that volunteered were the pilots that volunteered on the day. We didn't choose them, but I still think they were pretty representative of pilots in general. And finally, I had to standardise quite a lot of things. So I standardised everyone having the same practice at handle location, I standardised their grip and I standardised their gloves. And the reason why was because if I hadn't standardised these things, those factors would have confounded the more important things that we were looking for. But if we actually look at this in context, all of these weaknesses means that the people in the study had an easier time than those in real life. So if this was a real emergency, all of these factors, rotation, thick gloves, time pressure, will make it harder, not easier to throw. So all of our findings are in a sense magnified by that fact. The two people who weren't able to deploy their parachute would have died probably in real life. So while this study had weaknesses, I think that I can be confident in our overall conclusions. So if you're interested in this topic and you want to read the full uh, scientific paper, there will be a link in the description as well as a way to contact Matt. But Matt, what would you say are your top recommendations from what you learned from this study? If we just start with the equipment, underseat reserve handles should be positioned on the hip. It's where we naturally go. They should be easily gripped and positioned clear of other harness components. We should consider making the handles brightly coloured. We should consider having lead lines because we're underusing our visual system. So we should add visual cues to say where the reserve parachute handle is. Everything should be supplied as part of an integrated system. The deployment bag, the strop, the handle. We should move towards standardisation of safety equipment. If you are gonna supply stuff separately, then we need to make sure that they fit the pilot. We can't have straps that are so long that pilots can't extract the deployment bag. Finally, we are naturally going to want to pull our reserve handle upwards. So we need to design containers where if we pull upwards, the bag is still gonna come out. It's not gonna get stuck. We can't say to people, you need to pull your bag out sideways because 70% of people won't do that. And if you have a front mount, we have to secure them at the base so they don't lift upwards. If we look at what we need to be teaching people, I think in general, as pilots, we need to spend more time with our reserve parachute system. We need to understand it better. So in school, we need to teach people about the different components of it. At the end of teaching, we need to hang them up in a hang point and get them to repeatedly throw their reserve parachute. So even if that's just a handle attached to a beanbag, we need them to work out where it is and how hard they need to throw it. As experienced pilots in flight, we need to repeatedly locate our reserve handle. We need to visualize throwing the reserve, a bit like skydivers do every time they get on the plane. Finally, 
I think we need to throw them. I think there is going to be no substitute for people going on an SIV course over water, ideally inducing some sort of instability and practicing throwing their reserve parachute. We need to know how it feels. We need to know what those environmental cues are. We need to know how to kill the main wing. Because ultimately, if we're not scared of it, we will take that first step on the chain of survival, which is making the decision and committing to throw the reserve parachute. And lastly, I would say that for all the different theories of you can throw them sideways, you can throw them towards their feet, you can do all these things, I think we need to keep it simple. You need to hit your hip, grab your reserve handle and throw in a single sweeping action. Hit your hip and sweep away. Well, that, uh, that sounds simple enough. Just hit your hip and sweep away. Um, I personally want to say, Matt, thanks a huge amount for putting all the work into it. And I know you're not, you're not getting paid for it. You're doing it out of your own pocket and coordinating all these people and doing all these tests. So I think I talk for a lot of people when I say thank you so much for doing this. Um, any other things you'd like to say for people out there or people that helped you along the way you'd like to thank? Um, thank you. There are so many people I'd like to thank, one of whom is you. You've actually done so much. I, what you won't know from this video is that Andre supported me all the way through the process in terms of designing the right gear, how we can do the logistics, how we can do the filming, and then with making this video. So you've been fantastic. Um, there are a bunch of other people that I would like to thank. On the day, I was helped by the amazing hosts of Thames Valley Hang Gliding and Paragliding Club, by my friends Jeff Long and Sam Smith, and by my crew at the University of Portsmouth, Professor Mike Tipton, Heather Massey, Claire Eglin. I was also helped by a number of other folk, including Professor Chris Sanguin, um, David Thompson and the crew at the BHPA, all the guys at Flyo, all the guys in Go Ape and at Cranfield University, all the expert focus group members, and most importantly, all the study participants. Um, as Andre kindly mentioned, I fund a lot of this stuff in my own pocket, but actually from this, I was funded by the Lanarkshire and Lothian Soaring Club, my home club, who've been brilliant, all my friends who kept me safe throughout my flying career and who contributed to the funding of this study. I'm also very fortunate to be supported by the Royal Aeronautical Society GP Ollie Award. All right, that's it. Thanks, Matt, and thanks to everyone involved. You did an awesome job. Uh, I also want to want to thank these people that really help us do these videos. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye, thank you so much, Andre. Keep making the awesome videos. It is at times like this that I do wonder what precise sequence of life events got me into this position. <laughs>